we're set. <laughs> Please stand. Water you turned into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. None like you. Into the darkness you shine. kids to the front or a lot of times what I would do back then and you know the pastor probably remembers this is you would just preach from the back I think that's why he's <laughs> sitting back right there now and so we're just going to run from the back and then everybody's in the front right I know uh, so yeah we'll work on that for next week guys and I'll probably put a few more ropes there towards the back uh, <laughs> we'll make sure Stephen does that huh uh, wedge you guys uh, back up front. But welcome tonight, you know, what a glorious, glorious day uh, that God has given to us, uh, opening the windows. Uh, Michael did that when we walked in today and thought, what a great deal. The breeze is blowing through us, and, uh, and we get to experience God's goodness and his faithfulness tonight. So uh, before we get started, let's just uh, go to him in prayer. Ask him to visit with us uh, like he always says that he will do. Jesus, thanks so much for your love for us. We give you this day uh, 
Sometimes we don't understand the brokenness in the world. And, uh, but we do know that you came to heal the broken. And uh, that you are God. That you are on the throne. And we know that if our God is for us, what can stand against us? And we know that it's nothing. And that uh, the plans that you've had for us are there. Thanks for being God and uh, not giving us that job. Allow us to love this week. Allow us to love with your love. Even when we see people with us, makes it tough. Allow us to love them too. Allow us to be your light. Allow us not to hide it under a bowl, but to put it on a lampstand and let the world see it. Thanks for all you do for us, how you meet our needs. Join us now as we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is. Be 
So like in past weeks, we have the, uh, um, the emblems, the, the uh, red and the juice on, at corners and stations. And so um, when we get done with the meditation, then you can come up and then we will hold them until, um, and, uh, t until the end and we'll take them all together. Uh, a couple of months ago, actually just kind of when this whole virus thing started kicking in, I was... Uh, um, walking my dog, I've got a Scotty dog, and I was walking her at uh, Pokagon, and by myself, you know, just the dog and me, and we come upon this group of five women, and they were coming the other direction, so, you know, being a, a good citizen and doing my civic duty, I put my mask on, and, uh, you know, when they were getting close, and uh, so we walked up, and of course, you know, Scotty dogs are just cutest little things ever, so they were all you know, oh, is that a cute little dog, and, you know, and talking and talking and talking, you know, and then when I started answering them, one of them said, well, you're Mr. K's. I recognized your voice. I didn't recognize, you know, she didn't recognize me because I get this mad. I recognized your voice, and I just thought, that is so weird. 
So, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, that, that's me, you know. So now she said, well, you know, she's got a, she's got a kid in my band and that kind of thing. And, and the thing is, you know, she would sit out in the audience and she would hear me talk during concerts and she recognized me from that. I thought, wow, that is pretty interesting. Um, it's kind of like, you know, the voice, the, you know, a person's voice is one of the most recognizable things about them. Um, and uh, speaking of Scotty dogs, um, another kind of funny little thing. Uh, my dog's name's Ashling, which means uh, dream or vision in Gaelic. Um, but we let her out in the front yard on a tether, and um, she'll go out and she just loves, you know, bouncing around out in the front yard. But when it's time for her to come in, my wife Linda, she'll go to the front door, you know, and she'll call her and and call her and call her, and the dog will just completely ignore her. Because if you know anything about Scotty dogs, um, you know, different dog breeds have kind of different attributes. You know, they say, well, this dog is very loyal. This dog has lots of energy. This dog has, uh, they're very cuddly, you know, or, or whatever. Scotty dogs, if you ever look at a description, the first description is stubborn. They are stubborn. They really are. And so, you know, Linda will call, call Ashling, come on, Ashling, come on, come on, come on, come in. Then she turns to me and says, will you call your dog? And I go, come on. And she just runs right in. So um, there's just something about the shepherd's voice, or the you know the shepherd's voice. So um, I've got a couple. Actually, got a couple of verses here, and I'm going. To, I had to go home and get these. Tell you what, getting old, my eyes don't work as good. My ears don't work as good. My nose works fine. Okay, so uh, the feast of the dedication was then taking place in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus walked about in the temple area on, uh, on the portico of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said, How long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify to me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. And as I, here's one I think that goes along with it, but actually this is from 1 Kings. The Lord said to Elijah, go out and stand on the mountain and the Lord will pass by. Of course, you've all heard this one. This is one of my favorite little passages and of course and you know I won't read the whole thing but the there was a violent wind the Lord the Lord was not in the wind or the earthquake or the fire and after the fire there was a still small voice and Elijah recognized the voice of the Lord in the still small voice so um, I don't know how many of you are uh, bluegrass fans actually you probably wouldn't be going here if you didn't like bluegrass but uh, um, Ricky Skaggs, one of my favorite, one of my favorite performers and songwriters, and he wrote a song um, called "The Shepherd's Voice," which I thought was really cool. By the way, uh, he also wrote an entire um, um, Christian album called Mosaic. And the title song, if you happen to be in church last week, is basically Michael's sermon set to music from last week. So you should definitely check it out. It's really good. So in, uh, in this song that I'm uh, talking about now, this is uh, Shepherd's Voice. What I'm listening for through all the noise, a whisper in my ear, the shepherd's voice. So you know the shepherd's voice? You know the sh we know the shepherd's voice by um, reading the Bible, by being here. You know, So we have a good idea of the shepherd's voice. So the shepherd, we know the shepherd's voice, and the shepherd also knows your voice. You know, just like Ashling knows my voice, the, uh, the shepherd knows our voice. So, you know, like, like Ashling, for, for example, um, back to my dog again. I love my dog. Um, but uh, when she's outside, I can tell all of her different barks. She has a let me in bark. I'm tangled up bark. She has an evil chipmunk bark. She has a jogger bark. She has an the Amish buggy is going by bark. So, and I, I can tell every single one of them. I, you know, I'm sitting in there going, yeah, that's the let me in bark. I better go get her. So anyway, um, if I can tell the difference between 
my dog's bark and voice, how much more can the Lord recognize your voice? All you have to do is talk with him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your guidance, and we pray that you will help us to hear your voice when you whisper in our ear and even sometimes when you speak louder. We thank you and praise you for giving your life for your sheep and for rising again so that we can be with you eternally. In Jesus' name, amen. This is the first time I have uh, done communion on this format, so I'll be right back. I received from the Lord what I handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took the bread, and after he had given thanks, broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. 1 Corinthians 11.23 Let's pray for the offering. Lord, we thank you for the gifts you have given us and praise you for all of the blessings you've bestowed upon us. We pray that you will accept these offerings and that they will be used to their best advantage to bring more people to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm glad Mark shared that... uh, my sermon last week has been put to song, or was put to song, because you'll never hear it put to song from me. So uh, the blood drive is coming up June the 25th. Um, I got a call from them, and from what they told me on the phone, we haven't had too many sign up yet. And it's still a definite big need, and trust me, they are extra cautious. I gave the last one we had here a few weeks ago while the pandemic was going on. I've signed up to give again this time. Um, Very easy. Uh, My granddaughter even signed up and gave last time, and one of her friends from school came, and they're going to do that again this time, too. So if you haven't signed up, uh, the information is there in the bulletin, tells you how to do it. Uh, Make sure you do that. I'm going to go back a long time right now. Uh, Back when I was in high school, long time ago, we had a special speaker come in one time for our father and son banquet. We would have a big meal. The ladies would put it on. They'd always do it in the evening. They'd have a special speaker come in, and 
Sometimes it was on a spiritual basis, sometimes it wasn't. I know one year we had a Civil War reenactment guy come in and gave a little talk. This one year I remember in particular, uh, the speaker got up there and the first thing he said, I, he said, I want all you young men to turn to your dad and in 30 seconds tell him how much he means to you and how you appreciate him. Start. You know how hard that is to do? If I told you to turn to the person next to you and in 30 seconds tell them how much they meant to you, uh, it would be very hard for you to do. I don't think I got much out besides some stuttering. Well, we're talking about being an encourager tonight. I want to ask you, do you consider yourself to be an encourager? Do you encourage other individuals? Do you know how to be an encourager? Another thing I remember back from my high school days was a ministry we had there at the time by the name of Bruce Montgomery. Uh, every sermon, almost every sermon, he would have some kind of an illustration dealing with Snoopy. It got so you were looking forward to that every Sunday to see where he would come up with, well, I want to share one this evening. In one of the Peanuts cartoons, Charles Schultz showed Snoopy sliding along a frozen pond on his bare paws, and he was having a great time. But then Lucy came up. She slid out into the pond with her brand new ice skates on, and Snoopy did a little twirl, slid right up in front of her with a big smile, and Lucy, Lucy said to him, that's not skating, that's sliding. Snoopy just stood there. She went on with her lecture. She said, you don't have any skates on. Skating's when you have skates on. You're not skating at all. You're just sliding. The last depiction showed Snoopy dejectedly walking off the pond saying, how could I have been so stupid? I thought I was having fun. Now, you know people like that. When you go up and have a talk with them, I don't care how good you're feeling. Before you leave, you're about as low as you can get. They just walk around with a dark cloud over top of their head, almost a rain cloud. It's easy to be a discourager. Sometimes if we're not careful, we can be discouragers by accident, by simply blurting out something that we usually say without stopping and thinking where that person's coming from. Let me give you an example. This past week, being of the age that I am and some of the problems that I've had, I had my wonderful, wonderful colonoscopy. That ranks up there just about where going to the dentist does. But anyway, the day before, I got the phone call from the hospital asking you all those questions that they always ask, medical questions, all kinds of stuff. And anyway, when we got done with the conversation, and I know it was just reaction, the lady said, well, I hope you have a wonderful day. I said, darling, I'm in the middle of a prep for a colonoscopy. I don't know that it's going to be all that wonderful. And she got so tickled. She started laughing. She said, well, maybe I should not have quite said it that way. I hope you get through the day. And I said, I do too. So sometimes people are just discouragers by nature. Sometimes if we're not careful by what we say to people, we can be a little discouraging to them. Now, in his commentary on Hebrews, William Barclay wrote this about us as Christians. He said, one of the highest of human duties is the duty of encouragement. It is easy to laugh at men's ideals. It is easy to pour cold water on their enthusiasm. It's easy to discourage others. The world is full of discouragers. We have a Christian duty to encourage one another. Many times a word of praise or thanks or appreciation or cheer has kept a man on his feet. Blessed is the man who speaks such a word. Like I said, because it's so easy to be a discourager, and, and a lot of people are like that, a lot of people around just kind of sink to their level, unfortunately. Sometimes just circumstances alone can be rather discouraging. Right after we were out of college, Cecil Bird, a fellow classmate of mine at Johnson, he um, was getting ready to go on the mission field. He was very excited about that, raising his support. He and Betty, his wife, were getting ready to head over to Mozambique. Anyway, when he got over there, he was just full of enthusiasm, couldn't wait to win that area for Christ. He was in the downtown area, and for some reason he stopped for a moment, was looking at something, put his briefcase down. First day on the scene, somebody stole it and took off running with him. He was so full of enthusiasm, but just that quickly, things changed. Well, I hope, because there is a lot of discouragement going on around right now, simply because of the circumstances that we find ourselves in, uh, if you watch the news, and I'm not just talking about the pandemic, but everything else that's going on, 
Uh, a lot of people are really discouraged about life right now. Uh, like I said in my letter that I sent out for this upcoming week, um, we live in some times where a lot of people are just scared to death. And they're, they're just afraid. And that's unfortunate. Now, I'm not saying we should not use common sense, nothing like that. But I am saying we should not live in fear like that. We should not let that kind of discouragement beat us down. Uh, some of you have had the opportunity to travel, some things like that also. You've been to third world countries. I've been to some situations where I've seen people that are so full of joy because they have God, they have Jesus, they have their hearts full of that love. They live in huts made of cardboard, corn stalks. They bring their livestock in with them at night so they won't get stolen. But yet they have a happy life because they have Jesus. And sometimes we take our eye off of that. And so I'm encouraging us all tonight to try to be an encouragement. Uh, I hope we'll not only be encouraged by the time we spend here together this evening, but we can even try, even during hard times, to not get discouraged, but be faithful to God as an encouragement to other individuals. Well, we're going to work through the text first of all. Uh, Paul began this chapter, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, with these words. So when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. We sent Timothy, who is our brother and God's fellow worker, in spreading the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you in your faith, so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. You know quite well that we were destined for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted. And it turned out that way, as you well know. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer... I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter might have tempted you and your efforts might have been useless. Now, Paul was separated from the church at Thessalonica, the Thessalonians, and he was really discouraged about that. He didn't want to leave, but circumstances caused him to be able to do that. It's almost like a parent being separated from a child or a child being orphaned from his or her parents. Paul did not like the fact that he was forced to leave Thessalonica. You see, when you really invest your life in someone, as Paul did uh, with the churches that he visited and started in his missionary journeys, it was hard just to walk away from them. Paul knew uh, when he left they were vulnerable. Uh, he knew they were going to face persecution like he had told them they would. And even though that he had warned them about it, he was so concerned that it might turn them away from the faith. So Paul found himself in a dilemma. He was forced to leave Thessalonica. But he was terribly concerned about them, so what should he do? Now, if you understand the situation and read through all the scripture in this letter to the church at Thessalonica, he wanted to return. He tried, but there was always an obstacle. He could not get back. He tried to send another one of his ministry team, uh, but that would leave him in a vulnerable situation. So he was kind of in this dilemma. He didn't know exactly what to do, but he cared about those people so much. So what could he do? That's a similar dilemma uh, sometimes it ministers face when, when they leave a congregation. Uh, I've always had within my philosophy that after I've ministered to a church, and I will do the same thing here whenever that time comes, you're not going to see me. I'll just disappear uh, because you'll have another minister. Uh, that person will be the one that will be leading you. Uh, I've had over the years someone call me up and ask me about a situation. I simply say, I'm not the preacher there anymore. You need to call him or you need to call one of the elders. Now that's hard, because I like people, and I love being around people, and every ministry that I've had, I've made very, very good friends. But I've had to walk away, because that's what's best for the kingdom. If I ever get a call back for a funeral, or if I ever get called back for somebody that maybe wants me to baptize them, first thing I do is I say, have you talked to the preacher about that? They say no, I said, talk to him or I'm not gonna do it. And then I call the preacher, and I say, is this okay? Uh, that's just the way, that, and I understand what Paul's feeling here, because that's tough. You invest your time and your life into individuals' lives, but I believe in my situation as a minister, that's not a good thing to do, simply because I won't be the preacher here anymore. Uh, somebody asked me the other day, if and when that time comes, I shouldn't say if because it will, but when that time comes, where are you going to go? And I said, I really don't know. I I'm going to have to look around a little bit. Uh, that's kind of what I was doing when I left St. Joe and came up into this area, although I was drawn here because I'd had a c connection to this church for years. This was a church for my mom and dad, things like that. So it's a hard thing. Uh, but he decided 
that he had to do something just to make sure these people were doing okay because he knew the persecution that they were undergoing. So he decided to send Timothy. He said some good things about Timothy in these verses. He called him a brother in Christ, God's fellow worker. Uh, He expressed a confidence in Timothy that he would be able to strengthen them, to encourage them through his ministry to them. And this was a very challenging assignment for a young preacher. So let's look what Paul said about Timothy's visit to the Thessalonians. Jump in in verse 10, or excuse me, 6 through 10. But Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. He has told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us just as we also long to see you. Therefore, brothers, in all our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. For now we really live since you are standing firm in the Lord. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy you have in the presence of our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. So it seems like Timothy traveled to Thessalonica. He spent some time there ministering with the people, getting a report gathered to take back to the Apostle Paul, and came back with this good news. You know, it's interesting. Uh, This is only one of two places in the New Testament where the term gospel is used when it's not referring to the story of Jesus. That tells us, at least tells me, that it must have been some really good news uh, that Timothy brought back uh, to Paul during this time. His report, we read, included the fact that the faith and love of the Thessalonians were intact. He reported the Thessalonians had good feelings about Paul. They wanted to see him as much as he longed to see them. And I'm sure that was a relief to the Apostle Paul because he was concerned about them, the persecution, were they still strong in the faith. And when he heard that, he said, for now we really live since you are standing firm in the Lord. Now, I don't no, not, not, we know that doesn't mean that if he had not gotten a good report, he would have died. Of course not. But you know, if you have some really good news about a person you've kind of lost touch with, and you found out that things are going well for them, they're still strong in the faith, that's encouraging. That makes you feel really, really good. In everyday life, uh, as parents and grandparents, uh, when we receive news if our children live a long way off, uh, that they're doing well, then we're happy about that. Uh, We breathe a little easier. We live a little bit easier, if you will. And that's the same true in the spiritual sense. Paul was so encouraged by this good news about the Thessalonians that he said, how can we thank God? Enough for you in return for all the joy you've given us. Now, ask yourself, are there people in your life that you feel that way about? People that are just living the Christian life, that are so faithful that they're encouraging to you because of their faith? Let's look at verses 11 through 13. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Paul reminded them of his fervent prayer for them. He interceded for them, as he said, night and day. Paul was praying that God would clear the way so that they could once again see each other. Now, it appears as we read through Scripture that that never happened. Uh, So that kind of tells me that even the Apostle Paul uh, heard a no to some of his prayers from God because maybe they weren't in his best interest. And there's nothing more important that we can pray about is for each other, for our love for one another to grow, to overflow, uh, for Christians, for everyone else, uh, even those who persecute you, as Scripture says. And finally, also, Paul prayed for their hearts to be strengthened and purified. Everything in his letter looks forward to the coming of Jesus. Well, how can we be encouragers? We've got a few things there in the bulletin we'll talk about here very quickly. First of all, we can be an encourager. We can give encouragement by being present. Jeff's talked about the last couple, two or three weeks since we started meeting back together, how encouraged he is when he sees cars pulling in the parking lot. And he sees people that they haven't seen for a while. And I can see that too. As I watch people come in sometimes for the first time, maybe they happen to be at the same service for the first time, it's an encouragement uh, to see one another, to be strengthened by that. Hebrews 10.25 says, 
Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Uh, a lack of attendance is always discouraging for everyone. Uh, it's discouraging when we come to worship and, and we see folk that maybe we're looking forward to seeing uh, that just aren't here. And, and again, I know we're under different circumstances. Uh, we split our services up to try to help with the social distancing. And, and although when I came in tonight, I told Chris, I, know, I said, let's have an outdoor service indoor today. We got a nice breeze. We'll open the windows up. And as they tell us, that's the best thing to let the fresh air uh, blowing through. But it's discouraging because we're meant to be together to worship together. That's the way God intended it. That's why Scripture tells us uh, that we should be together and not forsake the assembling of ourselves together because it's so important. We should have this longing to be together. Paul experienced that longing when he was separated from the Thessalonians. And we ought to feel the same way. Uh, I don't like to miss our church gatherings. Because I feel separated. I understood what we were having to do when we were taping the service, but my weeks were not the same, folks. It's simple as that. I got days mixed up and everything else because my pretty much entire life has it, it revolved around being together on Sunday mornings. And when that wasn't happening, it just threw me totally out of kilter. Uh, I want to be with church. Uh, I, I want to be with fellow Christians to be encouragement to one another. Uh, I want to see people. I want to know how they're doing. I want to draw encouragement from their love for God and to offer encouragement to them. Another thing, I, I've talked to Chris about it a little bit. One of the most, I don't, know, I don't even know what word to use, aggravating, that's not the best word, during this time is not being able to go see people. Somebody goes in the hospital, I, I can't go see them. Uh, something happens at home, or I, I, you know, just not to be able to go see people has been such a frustration uh, to me, I, I call people on the phone and stuff like that, but it's not the same as being here together to encourage one another, to minister to one another. So the first way to be of encouragement is just to be present uh, when we gather together. Secondly, we can be an encouragement by being faithful to trials. No doubt, uh, going through trials can be discouraging for people, but the last thing we should think is that trials are discouraging to others, usually... Uh, the opposite is just the case. It's so encouraging to see people who are being faithful during tough times. You can mention individuals. We have some right now going through some very tough times in our congregation. But we see their faithfulness. We see their love for God. We see their attitude, even though physically they're being beat down, dealing with cancer, other things like that. But when you see them, gathering together with us, and we hear them testifying about their faith and their love for God, even through these tough times, how can you not be encouraged? How can you not be so happy during those times? Remember last week, if you were here or if you watched it uh, on the internet or on the YouTube, I read those journeys of faith. And some of those journeys of faith were even tough to read, to understand what some of those people went through. Now, I had a lot of letters and I'm thankful that some lives are like that. They were raised in the church, they were always in the church, and they're still faithful to God, and that's great. But you read those letters of people that have gone through horrendous situations. And there's a lot of others that didn't write letters that I've came in contact with in ministry over the years, and after I've talked with them or they've come into my office, I've thought, my gosh, how can you be positive? It's because of their relationship to God through Jesus Christ. And when we see those people and we hear those people, whether it's disease, divorce, death, I don't care what it is, that's not the time to stay away. That's the time to be together, to be encouraged and be an encouragement. And this is no reflection on me, and trust me, I'm not saying this for a reflection on me. The Sunday after my dad passed away, I was preaching. And I had people come up and say, you, you need to take some time off. I said, why? They said, you just need to take some time off with somebody else preaching. I said, no. I know this is where my dad would want me to be. So I'm here. Yes, it's tough. I'm not that strong of a person, but I'm here to honor him because I know of his relationship to God through Jesus Christ, and I know that's what he wants for his family. And when we see other people doing those things, and I'm not talking about going around with a big smile on your face and acting like everything's just fine because we know it's not, but when we're going through those tough times, and people see our faithfulness. What an encouragement. 
We can also be an encouragement by expressing our appreciation to others. Paul, any of his letters, you know that he's very quick to express appreciation to people. Uh, there was an article years ago uh, in the Christian Standard when they used to do the weekly publication. You guys probably got it here. All the churches did. But I remember one individual wrote an article that was called Give the Flowers Before the Funeral. And the idea was not to wait till somebody's dead before you start talking all those good things and buy the flowers. In other words, when you have the opportunity, while we're alive, send those nerds of encouragement. Uh, let them know how much you appreciate it. I've kept for years and years because of a minister that had a lot of influence in me when I first started ministry. He said, you need to start a pick-me-up file. I said, what's a pick-me-up file? He said, anytime you get a note of encouragement or thanks or something like that, you need to put it in a file in your filing cabinet and then just keep it there because there's going to be times in your ministry when you're really going to need to pull that puppy out and start reading to remind the fact that, yeah, there are some people that do appreciate you. And there are some people that like what you're doing because there's going to be times when you're going to get pretty discouraged in the ministry. And I've kept one of those now for years and years and years. And it means a lot to me. You see, most of the time, unfortunately, we're not all that upfront about our need for encouragement, but we do need it. Those words of appreciation, those words of encouragement are so powerful, and we can all do that. It's easy and should be to express appreciation for a great job, uh, for something well done. Uh, look for people who might be discouraged. If you know of people that just, they're just afraid to get out, and that's okay, send them some notes of encouragement. Call them up on the phone. Let them know that you're thinking about it. I think one of the neatest things uh, that Laura did during all this is when she had the kids. My grandkids did some, and they had a good time of it, making all those pictures. And then Laura taking him to the nursing home and then also mailing him in to a lot of the seniors and shut-ins. She got so many words of thanks back and how much it meant, uh, especially to the people in the nursing home. As they went around to every room and gave them and put them on their bulletin boards and stuff, what it meant to those individuals. Another thing we can do is be an encouragement by spending time with others. Not as easy to do right now. Um, one of the most encouraging gifts you can give to someone is say, hey, I enjoy spending time with you. I like having you around. I, I want to get to know you a little bit better. Uh, usually, it's an expression of how much we value them. Well, how do we do that? Well, we can invite people to come to our home. Well, right now, we're not supposed to be inside all that much. Have a picnic. Have them sit outside. Uh, a nice day like today, nice evening like today. Just sit outside and visit a little bit. Take a walk. Uh, get together when the opportunity affords itself for lunch or coffee. Uh, go to a ball game, movies, go fishing. There's just so many things you can do because understand the activity is not important. It don't make any difference what the activity is. What is important is saying, I want to spend time with you. I, I appreciate you. And I'd just like to get to know you a little bit more. One more thing. We can be an encouragement by praying for others. Have you ever had anybody tell you uh, that they're praying for you during a tough time, how does that make you feel? Encouraged. Uh, our prayer minister here is such an important one, and I, and I really appreciate uh, Tammy's efforts to keep the prayer list accurate and up to date, to send out those email notifications for those of you that are on that notification list, uh, the way we spend time praying for other individuals. Uh, when we have our staff meetings on, on Monday mornings, one of the things we always do before we dismiss, as we go over the prayer list. We give each other updates as we know. And then we also talk about maybe needs we have, uh, about praying for one another, and then we spend a little bit of time in prayer. I hope that you found some of these words this evening uh, a little bit of encouragement, uh, letting you know how we ourselves can encourage other individuals by your faith, by your faithfulness, uh, by just thinking. Uh, positively, and thinking about how to encourage one another by being present, by being faithful through trials, by expressing appreciation to others, by spending time with others, and praying for others. Something we can all do, and something that's so important, especially in this day and age. Let's pray, shall we? Father, I thank you for your love. Uh, I thank you for those that are gathered here this evening, those that will be gathering here tomorrow, for those that aren't able to be here yet. Father, I thank you for their faith. 
for, for people I see around me uh, within our church who are going through some really tough times, but still are so faithful to you, sharing your love with other individuals. I know myself so many times when I go to minister to someone like that and I walk away, I feel so much better. I've been encouraged because of their faithfulness. May we be doing that for one another as we look forward, like the Apostle Paul said, to your coming. To your son's name we pray. Amen. To be standing, shall we? Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again, whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes, bless the Lord, oh my soul. His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to Your heart is kind, for all your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name, bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul.
see everybody here tonight. I want to thank the three amigos for leading us in worship up there. So have a great evening. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. Awesome in power. Yeah. <laughs>